Welcome back to Real Cast Fishing Podcast. Your host, Glenn, with the City of Allen Fishing Field Team, COAF Field Team on YouTube. And this round, what I've got for you, we're talking about the Little Red Book of Fly Fishing. Uh, this is one that we're restarting from some past um, do-overs. Well, this is my third do-over now. So we're going to start from the beginning, uh, starting out with the uh, first part, part one, chapter one, the cast. 45 tips to help you cast straighter, longer, and more accurately. There's no such thing as the perfect cast. There are only casts that catch fish and casts that do not. In trout fishing, how your cast takes shape doesn't really matter as much as presentation, reading water, and fly selection. The opposite is true in saltwater fly fishing, where the cast is critical. I often thought that saltwater fly fishing and trout fly fishing are two entirely different sports played with the same basic equipment. You may have heard the golf adage, you drive for show and putt for dough. The same, <coughs> excuse me. the same is basically true with fly fishing for trout. Sepsi loops might impress onlookers, but the fish do not care how well you cast the fly, at least not nearly as much as they care about how those flies are presented. When I guide, I see so many people from amateurs to self-professed experts seize up and fail, often trading the perfect could have been false cast for the imploded damnit cast, simply because they're paying too much attention to perfection in the air and not enough to perfection on the water surface. The key is to relax. The cast is ultimately a game of feel, and your feel will be different from others. Find your own rhythm. Find your own stroke. There are guidelines and tips that can help you down the path of fighting the cast that serves you best, but achieving that cast only comes with practice. Definitely study the mechanics of good casting and work hard to throw consistent, tight loops. Try to eliminate the tailing loops. Being able to throw a long, beautiful fly cast will never hurt you. But that's not a prerequisite for being a good trout angler, no matter what anyone tells you. In my experience, take the pressure off of yourself is the first step to become a good caster. Do that and absorb these tips that follow, and the cast will come to you sooner rather than later. Signed, KD. And KD is the uh, co-author of the Little Red Book of Fly Fishing, Kevin Dieter. Uh, the other individual who wrote this um, book is Charlie Meyer. And so that was the uh, intro into part one of the Little Red Book of Fly Fishing. We'll take you to tip number one. And this first part is going to focus more on fly casting. So let's begin with tip number one. Dare to be different. Take a close look at professional golfers the next time there's a tournament on television. Although they shoot similar scores, you'll see surprising variations in swings. Some differences can be laid to body type or perhaps age or the rest to techniques and habits uh, developed over the years. The same is true with fly casting, although there exists what might be termed a classic stroke, much like Tiger Woods golf swing, you could use a variety of techniques to get the fly where it has to go. Certain physical laws pertaining to loading and unloading the fly rod must be adhered to and timing is critical no matter what your stroke looks like. But if your casting is different from that of your buddy, that's not a problem. It just has to work for you, not anyone else. Sign CM, Charlie Meyer. All right, so uh, good to know that, uh, hey, basically relax. Uh, there's some basic things to remember about your fly casting, but everyone does it different, so dare to be different and move on. All right, uh, next one, number two, it starts with the grip. In golf, 9 out of 10 swing flaws can be traced to your hands and how you hold the club. The same is true of the fly cast. It starts in your grip. You want to be firm without over clutching the handle. The line goes where the rod tip directs it to go and your grip dictates the direction of the rod tip. Because of this, your line hand, uh, because of this, line your hand up so that you can control how the rod flexes. Hold your thumb on the top of the grip then snap those casts. If you visualize looking through your casting thumbnail, odds are that the line will unfurl right through that window. Sign KD, Kevin Dieter. All right. Uh, yeah, that's a good one to keep in your back pocket with your thumb and casting through that window. And basically, uh, don't overclutch the, uh, the grip. It starts with the grip. Okay. Point your shots. That's number three. It's axiomatic that the fly line and thus the fly follows the rod tip. Taking that one step further, the rod tip follows the thumb. 
which is the strongest digit and the one most anglers place on top of the grip for power and direction. Lee Wolf used to cast with his index finger on top of the grip because he felt it gave him better control. He was the exception to the rule. No matter, so long as you keep your thumb or index finger pointed straight for the target, your cast will go where it's supposed to go. Signed, Charlie Meyer, CM. Okay, so point your shots. Um, give it a try when you're out in the field. Uh, you'll definitely notice that where you're pointing, where that finger is pointing, where that rod tip is pointing, that's where your line is going to be going. All right, number four, 10 and 2 is too little, too late. Many fly casting instruction books tell you to imagine casting as if your rod moves along an imaginary clock base with the forward cast stopping at 10 o'clock on the imaginary dial and the back cast stopping at the 2 o'clock position. That's correct, in theory. In reality, when casting, most people are oblivious to the positions of that imaginary clock. What, feel, <coughs> excuse me, what feels like 2 o'clock on the back cast may actually be 4 o'clock. When I guide, I... <coughs> excuse me. When I guide, I change time zones and suggest to clients to go to 1 o'clock on the back cast. For whatever reason, most people achieve the 10 o'clock, 2 o'clock mechanics if they're thinking 10 and 1. Try it. You'll see what I mean. Signed, KD. And um, I, I, I recall this one from our do-over startup uh, on this podcast. Uh, yes, give it the, uh, instead of the uh, 10 and 1, uh, the 2 o'clock mechanics, um, definitely give that a try. So... 10 and 2 is too little, too late. Think 10 and 1. All right. Okay. Uh, let's see. Number five. Don't get cocky. The number one mistake that most novice fly casters make is going back too far on the back cast. The only tip offs are the noises of lines slapping the water or the rod tip scraping the ground behind them. This happens more often than not because the caster is allowing his wrist to cock too far back. As it relates to fly casting, the wrist versus arm equation is a difficult balance to describe. Remember this, the arm is the engine, the wrist is the steering wheel. Yes, sometimes it's all in the wrist, but that pertains to matters of aiming the cast, not powering it. When you let your wrist power your cast, you will inevitably crash. If you have a problem with your wrist over cocking, there are a few simple fixes that will help you capture the right feel. One is to get a large, thick rubber band, wrap it around your casting wrist, and then insert the rod butt inside the rubber band when you practice casting. If you find that the rubber band is flexing too much, odds are that you're breaking your wrist too far. If you are wearing a long sleeve shirt, tuck the rod butt inside your cuff. It will have the same effect. And it will, take you, er, and it will tell you when you're cocking your wrist too far back on the back cast. Even seasoned anglers will tuck the butt end of the rods inside their shirt cuffs now and then, again to help them regain their stroke. Sign KD. And I'll take you to the picture that uh, they show in the book. And for those that are uh, listening on the podcast, uh, the picture is showing one individual with their hand or the uh, on their rod, and they tied a rubber band to their wrist to help keep that, um, I guess, the the rod butt up against their wrist so they don't bend it. Uh, another one, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> in the second picture, it's showing where they've tucked it in the cuff of their sleeve. And again, that's to keep you from over cocking or going too far back on your back cast. So something to keep in your back pocket. Hey, it's another good one from the book, a uh, red book, a uh, little red book of fly fishing. Okay, let's go on to tip number six. Stop in the name of love and a good cast. Let's see. <laughs> Excuse me. I got a slight <laughs> cough here, so bear with me. Okay. Uh, stop in the name of love and a good cast. When we watch casting, we are absorbed by motion, the back and forth motions of the rod, the fluid flow of the line trailing behind in symmetrical loops. Done correctly, it's a, it's a spectacle of motion, one that makes fly fishing so visually appealing. Always remember that the stop is a key component. One that makes all that casting motion work. A good cast is built by gradually accelerating the rod forward and stopping it. Precisely then changing direction and gradually accelerating the rod backward and stopping it again to change the course. With each stop, you let out more line. With more line, you exaggerate the time between stops. If you don't stop the rod crisply on the forward and backward strokes, if you just slush and slop your way forward and back with no precise rhyme or reason, you cannot load the rod. Your cast will droop sag, flutter, and die. The stop is as important a concern as any motion or power in your cast 
Stop with authority, forward and back, and you will cast farther, straighter, and more accurately. Sign KD. Okay, um, start and stop. That that's a biggie. Uh, it, it's 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 like um, let the line tell you that something's not going right. Is like they're talking about where it's sloshing. And it's just kind of slap on the water and whatnot. You know you don't have your tight loop. So keep that in your back pocket. Start, stop, uh, cast fast forward and backward. But remember to abruptly stop as well. Um, and these next ones are pretty good. They, they talk about similar um, starting and stopping fast uh, with these other techniques. So number seven, hitting the wall. You've heard the old expression after going after something hammer and tong. To learn how to fully load and unload the rod. Instead, think hammer and nail. Load the rod. Loading the rod requires definitive starts and stops. Stops and starts. One way to achieve this is to imagine yourself tight between two walls with nails on both. Using a two-headed hammer, pretend to smack the nails first on the back cast. And again, when the hand comes forward, each time you hit the nail, the hammer stops cold. In fly casting, this causes the rod to unload briskly. Much in a way of a flex pole propels a falter over the bar. The line shoots forward powerfully with a tight loop. Lacking hard stops and st starts, the line loses speed and distance and the loop opens up, making it a susceptible to wind. To get full power from your rod, hit the nail on the head. <coughs> Excuse me. So again, uh, this next one, number seven, uh, as well as number eight, is reiterating the start-stop fast an abrupt um, tip that is, is being said here. So number eight, throw a drink in my face. The best description of gradual controlled acceleration motion that is the foundation for any good fly cast was offered up by Steve Rajev. Arguably the best caster in all around angler to ever pick up a fly rod. He said to imagine throwing a glass of water or beer if you're so inclined. <laughs> I like that. Toward another person. You don't just chuck it. You lift it off the table, accelerate as you aim, and then stop suddenly to let the liquid fly. Imagine doing that when you make your cast, and while you might not fling the line as far as Steve does, you will cast with more accurate, more distance and accuracy. So think about that. Throw it a drink in my face, or your face, or someone's face, basically. You're stopping abruptly. Well, it's the same thing with your cast. Stop abruptly, get that cast going. Forward as well as backward. All right. Uh, number nine, take a bow. Let's take a look at this one. All right. The essence of power casting lies in the precision and speed with which the angler rotates the rod at the apex of the delivery. Call it a turnover, tipping the rod over, whatever term you choose. Perform this motion quickly, precisely, and the rod unloads with full power, flinging the line forward with optimum speed. But what do you do when you lose that timing? When your back cast starts to collapse and things seem to fall apart from fatigue or inattention, to rest your arm and recover the feel, lower your elbow and bring your arm closer to your body. Instead of trying to power with a tired arm, bend briskly forward at the waist at the point of delivery. Do this and soon you will find that your timing and speed will start to return. Bending or bowing with the cast is also an excellent way to add power for a distance cast with that full arm extension. Okay, so I'm I'm remembering when they say just, just, just take a bow is the uh, tip number nine, and it's talking about when you're getting tired and your your cast is starting to fail on you. It's kind of well, it's kind of losing losing because you're getting tired. Uh, one thing it was talking about was tucking your arm against you and then kind of casting with your body basically. Well, take a bow, you know, bend at the waist and whatnot, and allow your body to uh, get that that motion back again. So, Good one from Charlie Meyer in Little Red Book of Fly Fishing. Okay, let's go to number 10. Watch that thumb. Many people are frustrated with their line bunches and dies on the forward cast. This is usually caused by going too far with the back cast, which creates an open loop. The best tip I've ever heard for correcting the, that came from Dan Stein, a guide on the Bighorn River in Montana. He simply suggests that you keep your casting thumb in your peripheral vision at all times. Lose sight of your thumb, and you're going back too far. Simple as that. Sign KD. All right, and I've done that where you kind of just watch your thumb in the peripheral. If it goes too far, you went too far in your back cast. So keep it, keep it uh, in your peripheral. All right, number 11. Say hello to good casting. Colorado casting instructor Dan Wright uses 
this teaching aid to get his students to use to start his students used to starting and stopping the rod at the correct angles. Imagine you're answering an old wall telephone standing a couple of feet away. Say hello. <coughs> Excuse me again. I'm sorry. Say hello when you bring your rod hand smartly back beside your ear, keeping your arm perpendicular and then whisper goodbye at the phone as the phone returns to the cradle. Again, perform this with crisp dots and starts. So this is a little dated with a wall phone and all that, but you can also think about your cell phone kind of sitting on the holder and basically picking it up, starting and stopping. So uh, this is now the third tip in this first section talking about uh, better casting and uh, basically stressing or reiterating the starting and stopping abruptly when you're uh, setting up for your cast. Okay, number 12, William Tell Overture. Okay. The rainbow trout, a good one, rises deliberately and persistently in a quick current beneath an overhanging limb just a few feet away. Another tree close another tree close behind prevents even the wildest thought of a back cast. The solution, get a firm grass on the fly, taking care to avoid the barb and hold it low to the water. Now, keeping the fly rod tight in the other hand, thrust the rod tip forward with maximum bend while still holding the fly. Next, release the fly quickly while flicking the rod tip forward. The fly will shoot ahead to the full extension of the loose leader, dip deeply beneath the branch, and settle lightly onto the feeding lane. The, unsuspec the unsuspecting trout, a fish that never could have been approached any other way, eagerly slurps the fly. Most veteran anglers know this as the bow and arrow cast, and it works in more situations than you can imagine. Practice it and you'll be able to present your fly accurately in many tight situations. Signed, CM, Charlie Meyer. Okay, so the bow and arrow cast, I've seen that done. Uh, I've done it, I'm not so good with it, but every once in a while, it does come in handy. And I know some of the folks who are uh, doing some Tinkara fly fishing, um, or Tinkara fishing, uh, I've seen that also been done, uh, doing that little bow and arrow technique. Okay, let's go to number 13, tighten the loop. All right, uh, it's a fly casting axiom, short stroke equals tight loop, long stroke equals lazy loop. One yields power, accuracy, and a precise turn of the leader that also resists the wind. The other, it's okay for short casts in certain situations with lots of weight on the leader or fly. Otherwise, you'll get nothing but trouble from a broad loop. A beginning cast may be confused when watching a veteran use an extended arm motion when aiming for great distance. The long motion allows for the extreme length the line travels back and forth. The key is the power stroke, that magic moment when the rod tip over, when the rod tips over at a point near the angler's ear. It's quick, short turn during the power application that yields strength and distance. So remember that tighten the loop. Make sure you have a tight loop. Um, that's going to be key for uh, getting, getting some good, accurate, and straight cast. Number 14, anticipation. It's crazy. Let's see what this one has to say. This happens to all of us. While preparing to make a long delivery, delivery, we build momentum through a series of smooth, lengthening, false casts. Then when it's time to let the cast go, everything seems to come apart. The problem? The old bugaboo called anticipation. In our eagerness to get the most of out of that delivery, we try to produce too much. That smooth motion collapses into an ill-timed explosion of muscle that completely destroys the form of the cast. Casting guru Lefty Cray describes it as jumping out of your shorts. The solution, the solution, keep your delivery as smooth and even as with your false cast. Don't punch it when you need don't need to. Don't try to do too much. Sign CM. All right. Well, anticipation, uh, just kind of overdoing it. You're just casting away. And then when it comes time to actually uh, set that cast and get it where it belongs, where your fly where it belongs, you anticipate it, and next you know it's just crashing on you. So just um, don't anticipate. All right, number 15, groove your swing. A cast isn't about muscle. It's about tempo and timing. To groove that tempo, try piling 30 to 40 feet of line out the rod tip, out the tip of your rod directly in front of you at your feet. Next, cast the rod back and forth until you pick up all the line, first with short strokes, then with longer Pause strokes. The line won't stay or born unless your timing is right. If you're still tangling, that's usually a tailing loop. Pause by punching the rod too hard on the forward cast. 
When you learn how to lift that pile line a few feet at a time, you're actually grooving your swing with enough practice, it becomes second nature. So this is a good one to practice. I uh, just put a pile of 30, 40 feet of line on the on at your feet and just start slowly bringing it at short lengths at a time and you'll start getting your groove and in, in your in your casting stroke. That's a good one um, to keep in your back pocket. Again, for the little red book of fly fishing. Okay, let's go to number 16. See the you. Watching how your line behaves during the cast will tell you if you're making mistakes. It's tricky to self-diagnose the exact nature of a problem. However, and even harder to make the fix. Before you get bogged down in complicated physics lessons, try watching your cast from a fresh perspective. Dan Wright taught me this exercise. To help develop the proper feel for a cast, first tilt your rod sideways and cast from waist or chest level on a flat plane above the ground. Use a measuring tape stretched straight across the ground as your benchmark. Start with small flicks of line, maybe 15 feet long. As you look at the line shooting back and forth, you'll be able to see and feel both good U-shaped loops and tailing loops. Make forward and backward casts from the dead stop. Eventually link those casts together. Build line length gradually. As the good loops become uniform and sy systematic, you'll be able to lift that cast 90 degrees over your head, still watching and feeling how the line shapes. If you tail, start over. The key is keeping the tempo even. Good loops grow in distance with practice. And then in, um, in the diagram or picture that they're showing, there's an individual who's who's casting side side to side. Uh, shows a little line, um, dotted line, where they can keep their rod in that uh, that direction or at least follow along that line and uh, basically get the feel for a proper tailing loop. Uh, and then uh, it's eventually telling you to go and take it back overhead and do it at the 90 degree over your head. And because you know how that feels, uh, you should also still see that feel that same way uh, when you're casting overhead. All right, good one. Number 17, flick, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> flick the tomato. As we said, the best casting motion involves a gradual controlled acceleration to an abrupt stop. That's easier said than done, so imagine it this way. If you have a tomato stuck on the end of a stick and you want to fling the tomato into a bucket 20 feet away, how would you do it? If you whip the stick, you'll end up covered in ketchup. If you gradually fling the tomato off the stick, you might get it there. Same deal and same feel with the fly cast. Okay, so an abrupt stop. Controlled acceleration, abrupt stop. Flinging a tomato stuck at the end of the of a stick. Again, reiterating the need for the start-stop and abrupt start-stop. Again, this is like maybe the fourth, fifth tip Um or suggestion reiterated in just part one alone. So that's got to mean something. And guess what? Here's number 18, tossing the grape, similar to the tomato. Another way to consider the same process is to think of the cast as similar to tossing grape that's stuck on the tines of a fork. To achieve optimum projection, you stop the fork abruptly at a forward angle about 10 o'clock. So, boom, 10 o'clock. Boom, and there's your, your grape shooting over. Well, same thing with your cast. Boom, you know, toss that grape. Stop at the 10 o'clock. We'll do the same thing with your rod as you're casting. And guess what? You'll you'll start getting the feel of a proper forward cast. Okay. Number 19, tuck it in. Your aim is wild and you can't stroke a consistent path with the line. This happens to a lot of us. Don't worry. This can be fixed. The problem is most likely your casting arm is flailing. Fly casting isn't like pitching a baseball. The fracture cast embrace a compact short stroke by tucking copy of the Sunday paper in your armpit under your casting arm. If you drop the paper, your arm is wobbling too wide. And I've done that where I just grab something like uh, a magazine and tuck it under. And as long as I have it there, I know I've, I've got my arms in and I'm not flailing it about and messing up the cast. So uh, a good one to practice uh, as well. Just remember to keep your arm tucked in. All right, number 20. Too much, too soon. Perhaps the most common casting error, apart from breaking the wrist on the back cast, comes at the very beginning. Many anglers begin applying full power on the pickup, starting with the rod parallel to the water, while there is still slack line on the water surface. This immediately creates an extremely large loop while fa failing to properly load the rod. The angler spends the remainder of the cast sequence fighting to tighten the loop, eliminate wind resistance, and build line speed. Most often, he never recovers. An effective cast begins by stripping in excess line and smoothly lifting the rod tip to 10 o'clock. 
This places the rod in position to load while setting the stage for a short, quick power stroke. Remember, the shorter the power stroke, the tighter the loop, and the most and the more powerful the cast. Sign CM. Charlie Meyer. Too much, too soon. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's really just getting the slide, uh, the slack out of your line out of the water, and picking up on the rod and line so that uh, there's there's less resistance um, or or less slack to take up on your initial cast. Okay. So pick up that excess or that slack out of the line and then begin your cast. All right. Number 21, water load. In fact, I just did a video on this one um, talking about a water load where I cast the uh, line behind me because I was trying to fish a particular portion of the Blue River where there was a overhang and my back cast was clobbered and I was trying to cast to some trout that were kind of parallel to the bank and I did well. Anyways, let's talk about the water load. Let's see, number 21, the water load. I was enjoying an autumn afternoon of, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> uh, sorry. I was, I was enjoying an autumn afternoon of drift boat hopper fishing on the Yellowstone River with guide Rusty Boris. My problem was that my cast was consistently coming up about six feet short of trout wedged along the banks. As a team, we had two options. Rusty could roll us closer and risk spooking the fish, or I could muster up the missing distance. Rusty suggested a simple solution, solution for my problem. The key was having me start my back cast with a taut line and the rod tip pointed low toward the river surface. In doing so, he taught me to let the water resist and frictional force load the rod. When you start the cast, with your rod tip pointed straight in the air, there's less resistance. No instant energy source to tap into, no initial rod flicks, which ultimately shortens the cast or requires more unnecessary false casting. Start it low and watch it go. When you load the rod from the water surface, you give your cast a head start. This is particularly useful not only when you're covering trout water, but also in certain saltwater situations as such as bringing, such as banging repeat long casts into mangroves looking for snook. It also helps you form an instant tight loop that cuts through the windy conditions. All right. So remember the water load. Okay, number 22, let the current do the dirty work. A moving river current can be your best friend when it comes to avoiding tangles, setting up casts, loading the rod, and taking your best shot. Understand that in good conditions, a 20 to 30 foot cast is often long enough to produce results. As such, when I guide, I have a system for coaching people who have never held a fly rod in their lives. If you let the water do the dirty work, meaning let the current load the rod, even a beginner can make accurate casts, avoid tangles, and catch fish. Stand perpendicular to the current and toss your line in front of you so that, it so that it feeds out the end of the rod to a desired length as the water moves your fly downstream. When your line, with your line is extended and your fly is in the current downstream skittering on the surface, this sometimes catches fish, by the way, so pay attention. Simply lift the rod tip to the sky and lock it into that 2 o'clock position. Stop. Wait. Now fix your eyes upstream on the target area to want. <coughs> Let's say that again. Now fix your eyes upstream on the target area you want to cast toward. Bring the rod forward, snap it to a stop, and aim through your thumb. The fly line will unfurl, and your fly will usually land right in the zone. The key is the pause. Let the line stretch. Let the fly skitter. Lift the tip, set it up, and let it fly. No pausing and not letting the current load the rod is a tangle waiting to happen. Call it a super slow motion roll cast, a beginner trick, whatever. No matter how good you get, you'll find yourself false casting less and letting the current, the letting the currents work for you more often. Sign KD. All right, so I think that's similar to the water load. Um, all similar to that. Let the current do the dirty work. Let it let it take your line into the back cast and then cast it forward. Remember your thumbnail and looking through that window and getting it pointed. Where your finger is pointing, where your rod tip is pointing, your line is going. All right, number twenty-three, roll them easy. I find that a, I find that I roll cast on the river at least three times for every overhead cast I make. That happens a lot on the blue. <laughs> when you get the roll cast down and you learn to use the water to load your rod, you'll find yourself spending less time and energy thinking about casting. In turn, you'll be more focused on reading the water and finding fish. The roll cast is important for two other reasons. 
First, it's a stealthier approach and is less likely to spook fish than false casting overhead. Second, it's your go-to option. When there are bushes or other obstacles behind you where they're likely fallow, foul up a back cast, what's the key to a good roll cast? Same as with any other cast, gradually accelerate the rod, building speed and resistance, then stop, change direction, and unfurl the cast forward. Common mistake that people make is to start that roll cast with too much loose line on the water and the rod tip point is straight at the sky. Instead, retrieve with the rod tip from a low position with noticeable tension on the line as it slices through the current. When the moment is right and you've developed a feel to know when, lift the rod tip skyward and snap the rod forward, unfurling an on-target cast. Sign KD. All right, another good one on the roll cast. All right, uh, let's go to number 24, saving a stroke. Saving a stroke. When roll casting or making a roll pickup, save an extra motion and thus time with a potential foul up. With this tactic, with a lot lying still on the water, lower the rod tip near the surface and rotate it backward. Surface tension on the line will cause those loose coils accumulated around your feet to slide out through the guides, adding several feet to the line. Already in play and eliminating at least one false cast. As a bonus, this motion places the rod in line in the perfect loading position to deliver the cast. Done properly, this technique can eliminate false cast entirely. Ooh, gotta remember this one. Let's see, saving a stroke, roll casting to pick up, saving that extra motion, uh, line on the water, lower the rod tip near the surface and rotate it backward. Surface tension, uh, get rid of those loose coils, adding several feet to the line. Hey. Uh, always makes it easier when you can do uh, less false casting and more efficient. Okay, let's go to number 25, the Woody Hayes Rule of Casting. Okay, uh, let's go through this one real quick. Legendary Ohio State football coach Woody Hayes once explained why he closely embraced the three yards and a cloud of dust offensive philosophy this way. When you put the ball in the air, three things can happen, and two of them are bad. Whether or not the coach actually said these words, the quote has been attributed to Duffy Daughtry and others and got me thinking about the obvious correlation with fly casting. While beautiful long loops might be pleasing to watch, they usually don't do a lot for you on the trout stream. False cast spook fish. And all casts have the potential for de developing line weakening wind knots, which occur when an angler control when the which, which occur when an angler cannot control his line. Why not let the current do the work instead? Let the water stretch the line behind you. Lift your rod tip. High pause, then unfurl a pinpoint cast by directing the rod tip where you want your fly to land. The angler who learns how to roll cast and provides us with short mends, adjusts the fly line with the help of the current, and learns to let the water help him set up the next cast is going to be much better off than the one who tries to throw a Hail Mary on every play. While you might not beat that school up north every time you play, you'll commit fewer turnovers and win your fair share of games. So less time in the air and more time on the water and getting your fly to where the fish are. Okay, number 26, 40 feet in four seconds. I think I posted a little um, snippet of this one or I did a little practice of it where um, basically <clears throat> it's uh, being able to cast uh, 40 feet in four seconds while you hold you start out with holding the fly in your hand and casting to a designated target and getting within two feet um all within four seconds it's pretty cool it's it's a it's a good one to try practicing uh more practical casting all right practical fly casting practice I mean, in, in other words you, you use it while you're out in the field if you can do that you can definitely get your your fly where the fish is um yeah all right so let's um let's go through number 26 40 feet in four seconds different folks have tried to invent casting competitions over the years to rate fly fishers let's get this straight casting competitions rate casters not anglers i don't care what anyone says being able to cast a fly line 115 feet is entertaining but it's not practically important especially not in trout fishing. And while throwing flies into a fl floating hula hoop may be good target practice, it's a far cry from the real deal. My friend Travis Holloman, who fished the professional redfish tournament, but is an all-around angler and damn good trout fisherman, summed up the differences between 
real life good caster and a for show good caster this way. Give me 40 feet on target in four seconds and you'll catch more fish. I don't care if you're talking redfish, trout, or salmon than anyone. In other words, factor in timing. A real test for your angling skills would be to set out a course of targets that are all 40 feet away from you, numbered 1 through 10. Someone calls a number at random and you have 4 seconds and 1 cast to put a fly you're holding in your hand within 2 feet of that target. Not fast enough? No good. Not close enough? No good. Worked on that little exercise long enough and when Mr. Brown Trout pokes his head up in the river, you'll be comfortable with that uh, with what you have to do. Your cast doesn't have to be long. It has to be on target and on time. And that's what makes a good caster and a successful angler. Signed, KD. So again, that's the 40 feet in four seconds. Um, I did it two different ways. One where I didn't start out with the fly in my hand and then another where I did do it with the fly in my hand. And it's a very challenging... <coughs> It's a very challenging um, means of practicing fly, practical fly casting. Uh, so you're not you're not just a fly caster; you're a fly angler. Okay, so uh, keep that one in your back pocket. Number twenty six, forty feet in four seconds. All right, uh, number twenty seven. Come closer, darling, darling. Uh, close counts in fly fishing as well as dancing. Even though you may have the ability to deliver a dry fly with reasonable accuracy, a distance of fifty feet or more. Your chances of actually catching a fish increase dramatically with every inch you can trim off that. Granted, there are situations where a long cast is essential, but while your hero shots may earn applause from onlookers, they can catch trout mostly in magazine stories. Consider reasons for shortening the cast. Pinpoint accuracy to achieve just the right presentation. Less line disturbance on the water. Far greater ability to mend the control the, gri the drift. Mend and control the drift. Faster hook set and less line to manage after hookup, particularly if that fish is a good one. Though this extends to dozens of factors, all of which add up to less casting and more catching. Of these, drift manipulation is the most important. A shorter line translates to fewer intervening currents between your rod tip and fly, thus a much easier task in maintaining the drag-free drift essential to most presentations. To make this work, Choose an approach that puts you in the best and closest position to work a rising fish or a promising feeding lane. You'll be surprised how close you can approach in moving water. If the water is particularly swift and broken, cut that distance by half. For example, we can recall many times in a prominent hatch when trout splash for insects right beneath our rod tips. At first, this might seem frustrating, but there's a powerful message here. The grass isn't necessarily greener, nor the trout larger on the other side of the river. Why cast to a far away fish when you have feeding fish with an easier range? The manifesto for shorter casts goes on and on. Oh yes, did we mention fewer snagged limbs, wind knots, and other assorted tangles with a shorter cast? Signed, CM, Charlie Meyer. Okay. So, um, yeah, distance isn't always the key uh, to being a successful fly fisherman. Okay. Okay, uh, number 28, when not to cast or even twitch. Okay, this is this is a good one um, because I, I definitely learned uh, in some cold weather temperatures fishing the Blue River not too uh, long ago, a couple of weeks ago, where um, all I did was let the uh, fly drift, dead drift, and left it alone, and I was able to get uh, most of my trout that day um, with that no drift or uh, zero... Um, or dead drift and uh, no twitchy, no nothing. Just really did, ha hardly had to cast it other than get it out into the water where they were lurking and just leave it alone. So let's go on number 28. When not to cast or even twitch. One recent development in fly fishing <coughs> excuse me, on still water is the use of strike indicators for presenting nymphs. The concept is to suspend the fly just above the bottom vegetation where fish typically cruise to pick off insects and other organisms. The method of the method succeeds because the fly spends maximum time in the zone where the trout are searching. Trout looks for food. Trout sees fly. Trout eats fly. Angler catches fish. This tactic works best if you don't move the fly at all. Cast to the desired location. Let the fly sink and let it sit. The indicator, acting as a bobber, will hold it in place. In the case, in this case, patience is more than its own reward. And I, I have to admit that 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 one was a biggie. Last time on the blue, it was very cold. Uh, uh, rod guys were freezing. 
and basically cast it and leave it alone and just wait for the hook set or at least wait for the strike and then make sure you, you set the hook in time. Okay, number 29, control trumps distance. If long casts are needed in certain situations, they will count for little unless they are done accurately and with the precise loop control that needs to be uh, properly present the fly, to properly present the fly. If you don't keep your loop under control, all you're doing is casting your mistakes farther, quips Castmaster Letty Cray. Some guys are so hung up on distance, they end up casting a bird's nest, a robin wouldn't rent. Crazy message, master the form before you try for distance. That's a good one. Um, if you try for distance and you haven't really mastered your form and the basics, um, I think it just, just aggravates uh, as you try getting that longer distance cast. Um, mistakes get even worse and worse. And hey, Lefty said it, so it's got to be good. All right, number 30, pinky perfection. Fly fishers aren't effeminate by nature. But you'll occasionally find someone extending a little finger while casting, as if taking a sip of high tea. And not to worry, there's a sound motive behind such a peculiar act. Removing the pinky from the rod forces the angler to more thumb-directed, the proper position for keeping the stroke on track when the rod tip starts to wander. To, emph to emphasize this effect, also take your ring finger off the grip. Once you've recovered the feel, return to a normal grip. You'll discover that both your hand and both your power and your accuracy have improved. So I think this goes to just having a relaxed grip. Uh, pinky or ring finger off helps you keep more of a relaxed grip. Because if you hold it and clutch it tightly, um, yeah, you could be could be messing up your cast. Uh, so it's just a little pinky perfection just to add it to it. All right. Okay, let's go to uh, number 31. Cast around problems. Some days, satisfaction can be measured as much in the absence of frustration as in the presence of fish. Snag branches, wind knots, lost flies, most of these problems can be avoided with simple actions. When getting ready to cast, for example, take a quick look around the potential obstructions before you do. Cross the other side of the stream to free your casting arm from branches or adverse wind direction. Try roll casting whenever possible. School yourself in avoiding common hazards. You'll spend more time actually fishing while remaining upbeat and happy. A better posture for success. I think this one's more of a common sense one. Like um, if, if there's a tree in the way or if there's some brush there and you set yourself up when you could have set somewhere else to at least um, mitigate that issue with um, your back has hitting the, the trees behind you or some other obstruction. Um, I think all I'm saying is just find a better spot and... Uh, learn some of these other casts, like in this case, the roll cast. Uh, you'll find yourself using that a lot, uh, especially if your back cast is clobbered. So, hey, keep in that back pocket. Little Red Book of Fly Fishing said so. All right. And that was tip number 20, uh, 31, cast around problems. Okay. All right. Um, let's do, let's do, uh, let's go to tip 35, and then we're going to call it quits this round. Um Anyone have any questions, comments, you can definitely ping me in the chat. I'm kind of watching things here. And then um, hopefully uh, we'll be able to keep doing these. And in this case, uh, we started up this podcast series, The Little Red Book of Fly Fishing, uh, tied into, uh, we're calling it Real Cast Fishing Podcast, where we're talking basically fishing tips and fishing topics things that we want to bring up to our, our viewers as well as readers. And uh, we'll be posting this both from an audio standpoint as well as um, on, on YouTube uh, as well. So we'll have the, the video uh, podcast as well. So you'll see yours truly yakking away and hopefully I'm not boring you. Uh, and then those that um, well just want to listen to, to the podcast because maybe they're driving or commuting, you have that opportunity as well. So stay tuned. All right, let's go to number 32. And like I was saying, we'll close out at 35 and then um, we'll plan to meet again on the next episode. Okay, number 32, make friends with the wind. The windiest places I've ever fished was the Redfish Flats of Aransas Bay, Texas. It's definitely windy there. Uh, it was there as I was struggling with a flapping fly line that guy Chuck Naser called a halt to the action. Gently placed his hand on my shoulder and said, Son, you've got to have to make friends with that wind. Or else come back here in July when it calms down. But all locals are busy then, chasing down the chickens that blew out of the barnyard. 
The point was well taken, and using the wind to your casting advantage is especially important for the trout angler who has learned the hard way that breezes whipping through the canyon can mess with the best intentions. For a right-handed fly caster, the perfect wind is a gentle one coming over the left shoulder because it <coughs> keeps your line and flies pushed away from your head at a safe distance. When the wind howls from the right side, the tip top of your rod at a raised angle over your left shoulder, still pounding the stroke from your right side. When the wind is directly behind you, shorten and power that back cast high, allowing the line line to kite up when the wind's force. If you go too far back or break your wrist and let that rod tip blow the kite plane, the wind will power drive the fly line into the water behind you. But do it correctly and you'll reap the small or the same rewards as the golfer who finds adding driving distance with a tailwind. And the most intimidating wind of all, the wind that blows right in your face, might actually be your ally. After all, your back cast is where you load the power in the rod and a stiff breeze will help straighten the line behind you. To transfer that energy through teeth of the wind, make a slight adjustment of your finish your uh, <clears throat> adjustment to finish your forward stroke lower. Okay, and now it's just showing a diagram uh, how the wind is blowing and um, kind of making some adjustments uh, on on your casting. So uh, I, I noticed the middle picture is showing where the wind is coming from the right and the individual who's right-handed is casting pretty much with the line. Uh, he's still using his right hand, but the line and rod are going across his body and going forward and backward there. So okay, keep that in mind. Your The wind is your friend. In other words, if you normally stop the rod at 10 and 2 on the imaginary clock face, shift to 9 and 1, stopping higher on the back cast and driving lower on the front. Remember, punching the rod won't get you anywhere but tangled. This isn't a power game. It's about timing. When you can form a tight casting loop and make a small adjustment to counter the effects of the wind on the river, you'll never be blown away. All right. And, you know, I, I've, I've done one where... It's windy, and I'll cast up high, um, and what will happen is, is my line will be way up there on the back cast, and the wind just kind of blows it forward, and I'm just able to release line, and it'll shoot forward. So, hey, take advantage of that, that wind when you can. Okay, number 33, wind knots and the Big Bang Theory. Let's get one thing straight. Wind knots aren't caused by the elements. They're caused by what you do. It's okay. They happen to everyone. But I will say this, early diagnosis is the key to fixing the problem and getting back to business. And I've never in all my life seen tangled mess get fixed by whirling and twirling the rod tip. It might be human nature to try and undo the problem by twirling the rod in reverse motion, but the sooner you learn to stop and address the problem, the better off you are. When I see the intricate mazes of highly complex patterned knots that result from a microsecond lapse of concentration, it reinforces my belief that this whole delicately balanced universe may have and they resulted from a massive explosion. Signed KD. Okay, so this is a case where if you if you've ever been fly fishing and you're just casting and and you kind of have a angle starting or a miscast starting, and you're hoping to get out of it by casting more and basically flailing with your rod and whatnot, and it just makes it worse. I think what they're saying in number thirty three is basically stop and basically. Don't don't try to make it any better by casting more. Stop casting and fix the problem, which in this case is probably a wind knot or or a tangled um, leader in line. All right, number thirty four. Bass rods cover casting flaws. Ooh, I I do have a tendency to like the fast rods. So, well, let's see what this says. Technology is a wonderful thing. It has been applied to sports. Technology has done wonders to put us all in the game. Look, for example, at tennis rackets and golf balls. Composite materials, oversized heads, larger sweet spots, get the right gear, and you simply can't lose. Right? Not. It isn't the gear, it's the player. And that's just as true with fly fishing as with other sports. These fast action rods are great fun, and they do help you add distance to your cast. How? by compensating for errors in your form. When I practice casting, I practice with a slow or medium action rod. Then if I want to kick it up a notch, I use the faction of rod to my advantage. There is a real benefit to using the latest technology. They work. But ask yourself what the real advantage for you. Are you like Tiger Woods swinging the best clubs because they enhance your beautiful game? 
or are using it as a crutch, to be honest. Oh, ouch, ouch, ouch. I do like fast action rods, but guess what? I do have several, you know, fiberglass as well as bamboo. Um, and yeah, every time I use them, I got to remember slower because of that slower bend, that slower action. And, and in fact, taking advantage of the, the rod and that, that bend in the rod, uh, yeah, I have to admit, I, I do tend to cast better after I've cast with one of them and then I switch back to a fast action. Hey, that's a good one to keep in mind. I like that one. All right. Number 35. This is going to be the last one for this uh, episode. Uh, so we'll have to pick it up again with uh, number 36 in our next episode. But for 35, let's talk about this one. The double haul. One way to get more distance out of your cast is to use a double haul. It involves using your off hand and hold the line and pulling the line, then giving it back as you move. <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> as you make forward cast and back cast. What this does is increase the resistance and flexing the rod, making the line virtually heavier at the critical moment and ultimately increasing line speed when you shoot the cast. It is the hardest technique to teach to any fly caster because no matter how you describe it, it's the double haul is ultimately a matter of timing and feel. The most common mistake is that casters know, when, know and feel when to pull down on the line, but they don't give the line back to shoot to the guides. They pull... And then they find themselves with their arms far apart, with slack line that everybody really spoils the cast. Imagine your hands bungee cord together. Imagine your hands bungee corded together, okay? As soon as you make that pull on the back cast, let the imaginary bungee bring your back hand closer and feel the line slip to your fingers. So, yeah, okay. The best way to get the feel of a double haul is to start with a mini haul. Pull just a few inches at a time with short casting strokes until you sense that timing. With practice, you'll find that hauling becomes ingrained in your timing. You know how to make a strong, sharp hauls when you're becoming an eight weight or when you're when you're booming an eight weight through the wind on the flats. And you may also catch yourself, perhaps subconsciously, mini hauling as you cast the through weight at Brookies in a small stream. All right. So, uh, Sign KD. Okay, so that was number 35. From the little, little Red Book of Fly Fishing. Number 36 is just a flick of the wrist. We're going to stop here at this point. And, um... Oh, uh... Yeah, we'll stop here. Okay. So, this is the Real Cast Fishing Podcast. It's a, it's a, a podcast that uh, we're starting up. It's uh, in partnership with our uh, City of Allen Fishing Field Team. C-O-A-F Field Team on YouTube. YouTube channel. And uh, what the intent is, is to talk uh, fishing uh, tips, in this case, fly fishing tips in the Red Book of Fly Fishing, but also fishing topics in general, um, things that may pop up and whatnot. So uh, doing this uh, from a video standpoint, but at the same time, uh, I'll be reposting this uh, in the audio portion so that uh, for those that may uh, want to listen or uh, hear the information out of the Little Red Book, at least for this series, uh, can can do so, let's say, while they're driving in traffic, commuting and whatnot. You can just put on a podcast and just listen so you don't have to worry about um, uh, your hands anywhere else other than the wheel while you're driving. All right. So with that, uh, let's close out the Real Cast Fishing Podcast, Little Red Book of Fly Fishing Series, Episode 1. Appreciate you all joining today, and do stay tuned. As we get uh, uh, another episode out there, starting with tip 36. Just a flick of the wrist. All right, all for now. Next time we'll catch you all later. And good luck with your fishing. <laughs>